the truth is it's a million miles from the reality of EU Africa trade policy as it exists now. Because our economic relations with Africa are simply a continuation of European colonialism, perpetuating exploitation by other means. Africa trades more with Europe than it does with itself. It's portrayed as a poor continent, but actually it's the richest. It's just that the people there are denied the fruits of their land and their labour by unequal economic relations, by unfair trade rules, by illicit capital flights into the Western banks, and by multinational corporations allowed off the leash by Washington, London and Brussels. Hello my good people and of course welcome back to our channel. Now this video is meant for educational purposes and of course let's learn from our past because uh, what we see with our open naked eyes is not what is real in the ground. So guys I want to watch this video as this sister here is trying to educate Africans, black people and other white people who wanna mess up with Africa and think that they'll run away with it. So I want us guys to watch these videos. Then at the end of this video, I'm gonna talk about why African history is not taught the way it is and why they have distorted our African history to make us feel like we are less important. So guys, let's watch these videos, then come back and discuss. But the truth is it's a million miles from the reality of EU-Africa trade policy as it exists now. Because our economic relations with Africa are simply a continuation of European colonialism, perpetuating exploitation by other means. Africa trades more with Europe than it does with itself. It's portrayed as a poor continent, but actually it's the richest. It's just that the people there are denied the fruits of their land and their labour by unequal economic relations, by unfair trade rules, by illicit capital flights into the Western banks, and by multinational corporations allowed off the leash by Washington, London and Brussels. I don't think you'd have to be a genius to know that the last thing the Horn of Africa needs is more foreign military bases, more weapons and more European meddling. What we call our strategic relationship isn't about human flourishing, it's about the EU's ambitions as a superpower. There's now a new great game in the Horn of Africa. Greater and lesser powers are pockmarking the place with military bases. France, the US, China, Germany, Japan, Italy, Saudi Arabia all have a presence in the tiny area of Djibouti alone. Mercenaries are swarming in from all quarters. The entire region is being militarized. War is in the air. And what about the people facing climate and food insecurity? None of this benefits them. We talk about instability, but we only make it worse. We flood the place with weapons, hand over the profits to European arms companies and charge the bill to our citizens. And then with the carnage, we go back in and we do it all again. It's a racket. Strategic relations Relationship, it's one thing after another, isn't it? Really, it's the same as it ever was. And all I can say is, God save Africa from Europeans offering help. All French soldiers and military must leave the African continent. And this also should apply to neo-colonial military bases, including the African Command Center of the USA. We don't want the army of America. We don't want the army of France here. We don't want the army of anyone. We want African army on African soil. Tell me, why is it that we are here in Ghana? There is a, a, a military base here that American soldiers can walk in. No passport, no ID. They walk right through. If they commit crimes, they rape women, they kill women. No policeman in Ghana can touch them. Why? Where is the Ghanaian military base in the United States? Where is the French military base? Where is the, where is the Burkina Faso military base in France? Where is the um, Nigerian military base in Russia? Every superpower is, make, is building bases throughout Africa. Where are the African military bases in those countries? As I say some of these things, it's almost like it's a joke. So we need more Traores in Africa. Nigeria said when the U.S. government increased their visa to 250 to get a visa to go to the United States, Nigeria said, no worries, you also have to pay 250 if your people want a visa. But turn around and go to Namibia, I was shocked. 
Namibians pay about $170 to get a visa to go to the United States, but Americans, when they go to Namibia, nothing, zero, not a penny. Just come. Now, guys, let's have a serious conversation here. Who is stupid? Whose problem is it? We have the problem. What is leadership doing? Leadership is doing nothing. Leadership is voting on sheer stupidity. Stupidity that is causing us havoc. The same people who are abusing us, taking advantage of us, exploiting us, they are laughing at us because we are jokers. What are we doing in our parliaments? And that is why you see what's happening in Burkina Faso. What's happening in Niger. What's happening in Mali. The youth are saying, now we know. Now our eyes are open. Now we know who the real problem is. Yes, we know the enemy as the former colonizers. We know the enemy as the multinationals who are in our countries siphoning as much as they can. Yes, we know the NGOs are nothing but wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes, we know some of the embassies are no good. They are there to make sure that the instability in our countries continue. We know all that. However, we also know that our leaders could stop it. So yes, it is that the youth are rising. The youth are saying, you leaders, if you do not do the right thing, we will replace you. So we need more Traores in Africa. What's happening in Burkina Faso must be supported. What's happening in Niger must be supported. What's happening in Mali must be supported. The youth of Africa are sick and tired of being sick and tired. The issues of the route must be addressed. World Bank must stop giving us frivolous loans. World Bank must treat Africa fairly. Ours is a simple ask. We are simply saying to the world, we demand Africa that can be treated fairly. An Africa that can be treated as equals on the world stage. An Africa that is free of racism, bigotry, and hate. Our ask is a simple one. Our position is of stating the facts, stating the truth, constants that do not change. We are simply asking that the world does unto us what they would want done unto them. Anybody that has an issue that Africa has taken is somebody who is under earth. We want a peaceful world. We want a world that is just. And that is all we are asking. Why is it that we are unable to come together and speak our truth and demand that what needs to be done must be done? It's because they defeated us where it matters the most, which is their mind. It started with the missionaries in Africa long before slavery. They were sent by the Roman Catholic Church to subdue the Africans, make them believe that when you get slapped, turn the other cheek, and that your riches are in heaven. So by the time they followed with the colonizers to rape and rape Africa, we were already brainwashed. We were meant to believe everything African was bad and undesirable and everything European was better. Africa could potentially be the greatest partner, ally, and customer base that the Europeans ever had, but only if they rethink the relationship they have with the African nations and put an end to what we refer to as neocolonialism. First, let me ask the Westerners, how have regular Europeans benefited from the current relationship with Africa? And I don't mean the ultra-rich. I mean the regular person in Europe working a 9-to-5 trying to make ends meet. I can't think of many ways, if any. Regular French people aren't exactly getting a dividend payment from the financial chicanery with the West African franc. Regular Germans aren't getting energy resources any cheaper from the European mining companies in Africa than if they dealt with the Africans directly. Regular Swiss citizens aren't getting any kickbacks when money is laundered through their country. So why let this system continue? In the back of Europeans' minds, maybe they think they are benefiting from the current relationship with Africa, but in reality, only a small group of people are benefiting, and if you're watching the video, you aren't one of them. Them. Here's the real cold water for the Europeans. Those people who are exploiting Africa are also exploiting you. 
Most Europeans can't afford to have families before 30 if they have kids at all. Europeans are seeing their healthcare services cut, they are seeing prices rise as the European Union engages in reckless monetary policy to give handouts to international banks. And those financial conglomerates you're hosting don't care about Europe. They believe destabilizing Africa to exploit it for its resources, as well as lowering European standards of living by piling them in debt, are equally good business models. So how about an alternative path, where Europeans stop letting a small group of special interests dictate their relationships with the rest of the world, particularly with Africa? How about not letting the European continent be a safe house for some of the most corrupt people in the world? And why not create mutually beneficial relationships with the rest of the world where the regular European and the regular African both benefit? We are going to be talking about this on Friday, September 22nd from 2.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the UN General Assembly in New York City. We are going to have panel discussions on topics ranging from real estate in Africa, opening businesses, industrial development, opportunities for the diaspora, and how to make that first step towards investing in the success of Africa. If you're looking to get investors for a project, you 100% need to come to this event and pitch your vision at the deal room. This event is free, but does require an RSVP, which you can find at Eventbrite. Just search for AFPC United Nations General Assembly. And if you can't make it to New York, we will be streaming on youtube.com slash at business in Nigeria. Thanks to my friend Kenham, who you should definitely follow on social media. Now, I'm not asking anyone to support these Pan-African events because it's the right thing to do or make any appeal to an individual's morality. Instead, I want people in the Western world to realize that rethinking their relationship with Africa is just good business sense. And if you come to New York City, you'll see what I mean. But I want to know what you guys think. Do you think Europeans should support Pan-Africanism? Have you attended any Pan-African events recently? How did it go? And do do you think that the regular people in the Western world can regain control of their governments and repair the relationships with Africa? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if this video provided value to you, give me a like and a follow. That really helps out my channel, and I'll see you on the next video. Or maybe we'll see you at the UN in New York City this weekend. If you make it, be sure to say hi. Take care, guys. White people aren't having kids, and that's why I'm not investing in white areas. I'm investing in Africa and places where there's actually population growth. Now, I know that's not politically correct to say, but ultimately, my fiduciary responsibility is to my business and the people I advise, and I got to tell them what's really happening. And the reality is, if you're investing in areas that have majority white populations, long term, those investments are not going to be very good. Now, in the short term, yes, these investments in white-based areas can be very good because you generally have two incomes in households and they throw all of their money into consumption or maybe having one or two kids. That's great on the short term. But long term, once these people get older, that's game over for them. Take Ghana, for example. In Ghana, a population right now is about 35, 36 million. Some people put it a little bit higher, but the population is projected this century by about you know, 2050, 2060 to be more in that 60 to 70 million range. So the demand for goods and services, the demand for real estate, the demand for everything, the workforce is all gonna be dramatically improved in Ghana. Whereas in these white areas, I mean, having one, two kids, population is just going to, and if you're in these areas long-term, you better hope that there's immigration. Otherwise the economy is just going to shut down. If you're looking to invest long-term, consider Africa. Now, good people, after watching these videos, I really want to know your thoughts in the comment section. Tell us what you think about these videos. I've been telling people that Afghan history is not what we learn in schools. Our Afghan history has been basically destroyed or distorted. Most of the Afghan histories that are taught in schools are basically to make the white supremacy win, to make black people see themselves as less important in the society and cannot innovate or invent anything because white people will do those inventions for them so this has made Africa look smaller in so many areas even our kids the kind of curriculums that are being taught in school are basically to make them seek for employment in that they can't even create some employment for people they finish school after finishing school uh, they seek for employment from other areas from other companies or they fly outside our continent to go look for jobs outside africa so i want us to look some areas why african history has been distorted number one is the colonial narratives and power dynamics 
During the colonial eras, European powers sought to justify their role over African territories by portraying Africa as a backward or uncivilized. These narratives often ignored or misrepresented African achievement systems of governance and cultural complexity to depict Africans as needing European civilization and enlightenment. It makes Africans look like they need Europeans, the presence of Europeans in their land. They need Europeans in technology. They need Europeans in everything. In everything. It has made Africans to be uh, dependent. They depend on the Europeans' inventories. So it, it means Africans can't invent anything because they cannot do that. They don't believe in, in themselves. We don't believe in ourselves. So the history has made us to look like we need Europeans. But in real sense, Europeans need us. They need our presence. They need the presence of, of our continent. And uh, this has made our African people to look down upon themselves. They can't even sit down and think of how they can create something that will help the world. And if they do so, the world will come for them. The colonial powers imposed their languages, values, and historical frameworks on Afghan societies. This process tended to erase or reframe Afghan perspectives, prioritizing European viewpoints over indigenous ones. In number two, we have got oral history versus written history. African societies traditionally preserved history through oral storytellings. We used to get stories from our grandmothers, performance and arts rather than written records. Since Western historiography often favors written documents, oral histories were sidelined or discounted as less credible. Even though these oral histories were complex and meticulously maintained, European historians often neglected oral histories or misinterpreted them without a deep understanding of the cultural and uh, symbolic context, leading to misunderstandings or distortion. Then we have got number three is misinterpretation and bias in archaeology and anthropology. Archaeologists and anthropologists studying Afghan societies sometimes brought biases that influenced how they interpreted findings. For example, European scholars might frame ancient African cities or civilizations as anomalies rather than understanding them as part of Afghan rich history. Afghan achievements in science, mathematics, trade, and architecture such as the Great Zimbabwe or the empires of Mali, Ghana, Songhai were sometimes attributed to external influence instead of being recognized as homegrown innovations. Then we have number four, political agenda and Eurocentrism. Eurocentric education system, particularly during and after the colonial period, often presented history through a European lens, emphasizing Europe's contributions to world history while downplaying or ignoring African civilizations. In many education systems, African history was minimized or neglected to brief mentions reinforcing a narrative where Africa was peripherals to mainstream history. Then number five, we have got the modern media and uh, stereotyping. Even in modern media, Africa is often portrayed through a limited lens focused on poverty. Africa is brought on the screen as a poor place, a poor continent, a needy continent, a continent that can't survive without the existence of Europe, a place of conflict or exotism, which overshadows the continent's diverse histories, innovations and successes. This focus continues to perpetuate stereotypes rather than offering balanced representations affecting how people globally perceive African history, African culture, and the African people. Then number six is the lack of African perspectives in historical scholarships. Historically, African voices and scholars were not part of mainstream academic discourse on African history. There is no African who is allowed to tell the story of Africa or the history of Africa. The history of Africa has been left in the hands of the white scholars or white historians to tell our history. 
our people are not given the chance to come on the screen and write documentaries speaking about the history of their ancestors or of their continent. So this has made African history to be distorted in the documented books. So this is why I tell people that it is good to get findings of how our history should look like rather than depending on the history that has been given to us by the people that colonized us. These people can't tell our history the way it should be because they must hide some many things for the future and not to learn the history. They cannot accept that the future learn the history. How can someone who stole your values, who stole your respect and unalived your people come with the history forced you to believe that that is your history? It can't make sense, man. So let's tell our history the way it should be told and because this is our own story. No one can come and give me a story of my own people and yet his bloodline does not lie within that community. Meaning he can tell nothing about the history or the story of those people. So let Africans stand up strong and tell their own history the way it was told because these people are here to manipulate us and make us believe that they are much superior than our own ancestors or than ourselves. So our kids growing up knowing that they are less important. Let Indians tell their own story. Let Africans tell their own stories. Let everyone tell their own stories because we understand our history better than they do. Allow Africans to write books, print documents, talking about their own history which is very painful so guys thank you so much and of course if you're watching this video for the first time please subscribe like this video and of course share this video to as many more people as possible please tell us what do you think should black people or african people be left to tell their own stories rather than reading books that are given to them by the people that colonized them okay thanks so much guys